The last propeller-driven fighter to serve with the British Royal Navy, the Hawker Sea Fury, was one of the fastest production single piston-engined aircraft ever built. Heavily armed and solidly built, the Sea Fury entered service two years after the end of World War II as a replacement for Britain's mixed bag of carrier-launched supermarine Seafire, Sea Hurricanes, and U.S.-built Martins and Vought Corsairs. The first Sea Fury prototype, powered by a Bristol Centaurus 12, had first flown on February 21, 1945, but the first fully navalized version with folding wings did not fly until October 12, 1947. In May 1948, the first Sea Furies became operational with number 802 Squadron in the form of the Sea Fury Foxtrot Bravo Motel Kilo 11, of which 615 were built. Today, the few remaining Sea Furies are highly prized, with at least 10 having been modified for air racing. Several others are very active on the airshow circuit. Good afternoon and good afternoon, Oshkosh. How's everybody doing? Wow, okay, come on. How's everybody doing? I mean, my goodness. Is this Wisconsin or is this heaven? Isn't this great? Especially if you're out here on Saturday. Uh, show of hands, first uh, air venture. How many, the first, how many rookies here? Fantastic, all right. Do you over here? Great, well, welcome. Welcome to Warbirds in Review. We weren't out here this morning, but we're out here now, and we'll be out here twice a day most of the rest of the week. My name is Chip Berger. I'm the voice of the Warbirds Living History Group. That's that group of uh, characters, and I mean characters, in all those khaki tents over there in our campground. Please come over and see us. Come visit it. Some CR displays. Talk history with the guys. There's a bunch of amateur historians out there who are just dying to talk to you. So uh, our part of the show before we get into the real wars review, uh, as a warm-up act, is kind of talk about the human element. You know, you're going to talk to guys who are experts in this aircraft, the history, how it's used, etc. We're going to talk a little bit about the human element in terms of what fellas wore in terms of flight uniforms and equipment as it relates to certain theaters, certain aircraft, certain branches of the service, uh, and certain parts of the war. So we're very delighted to have a new organization in camp with us that we haven't had before, and that's people representing the Fleet Air Arm. That's the naval aviators in the Royal Navy. And one of the beauties of the flight gear and demonstrating it to folks is you can see how it improved over time. Sometimes that was driven by the equipment. As the equipment got better and more advanced, the flight gear had to keep up with it. And sometimes it was just we got to come up with a better solution for this, all right? So all of my, my left, your right, are two gentlemen here who are wearing Fleet Air Arm uniforms, if you can call them that, if you like our footwear, not the usual flying boots you see out here and the like, uh, for different time periods of the war um, and uh, different parts of the world. So what you have here, this gentleman to my left here, is from... 1941-ish, some really dark days in the Pacific, bloody shambles of places like Singapore and the like where things were just not going well for the Commonwealth, His Majesty's forces, 
uh, RAF, RAAF, and for the fleet air arms. So he is in pretty much scramble mode here. You notice a lack of parachute. They're just getting ready to go because they are completely outnumbered uh, by Japanese air forces. So again, you're in theater. It's hot, it's humid, you're not flying at 30,000 feet, 28,000 feet like the 8th Air Force missions uh, over Europe uh, later in the war, or Bomber Command for that matter. So we're, everybody's kind of dressed you know, pretty, pretty light for the weather. So from uh, top to bottom in terms of the gear, he's wearing his uh, naval uniform cap. Um, that would be for on base, etc., and the like. But for actual flying, he would have a flight helmet. And this is the early war type flight helmet. They were pretty much the same uh, RAF versus uh, the Fleet Air Arm. It's an Air Ministry helmet. This is known as the Type B. And you can tell it from a country mile away by these large padded earphones, uh, which cut down on noise and kept things closer to your head. And uh, to protect his eyes, he's got a pair of Mark III goggles. Okay, they're just kind of a very simple plexiglass, fits on the bridge of the nose, etc. And he's got one of the earlier oxygen mask systems that was used by the aviators uh, in the Commonwealth. This is what's called a Type D mask. And as you can see, it's, it's pretty much a piece of chamois, right? Uh, with a supply hose like this, buckles in. And then you've got a communications connection here. There you go. So this plugs in both the headphones... It's all one common set, and the Brits called this the bell plug, and you can see why. And if that isn't over-engineered from a radio headset standpoint, this plug, I don't know what is. This also goes to a carbon microphone that is in his oxygen mask here, and there's a little handy-dandy on-off switch. Um, not a whole lot of high-altitude flighting going on during this phase of the war and in this theater, but that's what they had they would have been issued. Okay, we're flying over water. We're in the Pacific. Um, so he has with him a life vest known as a May West. And for the younger people in the crowd, if you don't know why it's called a May West, ask your grandfather and just watch the smile develop on his face. And for the rest of you, just, you know, smirk because you probably know. Uh, these early ones, what they did was uh, give them a couple of puffs before they got going just to get them partially inflated. It's pretty much a manual inflation job, but you would want to have at least some air in that. And so just right there, just like a pipe scent, get it going up there, get some puff in there before you get kitted out and get into whatever you're flying to go uh, fly after the Japanese in this particular part of the world. And uh, this is uh, called the, the Pattern 32, after the year 1932 that was introduced. So this is nine-year-old technology. If you look at the ones in the Battle of Britain, not in the movie, because those are like canary yellow Spanish ones, but if, if you look at pictures, color photographs from like, the Battle of Britain, the original ones that they were using were olive drab, like the color on the back here. You turn around, rotate there, They're like this color. Well, if you're trying to spot somebody who's been down, especially in water, this kind of blends in. But if you dove it with some nice screaming yellow canary paint, you can see that bobbing around in the water a lot easier than something uh, olive drab that might just blend in with, uh, the, with the water, especially over in Europe. But it definitely works with the colors of the waters of the Pacific. And uh, to protect his hands, although you do see a, a lot of uh, photographs of the pilots uh, fighting in this part of the world during that uh, ugly, sad time frame, just you know, barehanded, get in the plane, get in the hurricane, get going. Uh, but he's wearing gauntlets. These are the uh, earlier version. I call this the Pattern 33 after the year. And you can see the zippers are just kind of straight here. Later on, they figured out, you know, they're a lot easier to take on and off if you put the zippers at a diagonal like that. And trust me, if you got hot, sweaty hands, you're trying to get these off, um, which you'd want to do, you know, in the water. Uh, yeah, these are a lot easier to manipulate than that. All right. Thank you very much. So why do I have a nice hand of applause for Lieutenant, Lieutenant, 1941. Okay, moving on towards late period in the war, and you can see some of the improvements. Again, we've got a pretty much stripped down, appropriate for the theater, appropriate for the weather and climate conditions uniform. And over that, he's wearing some improved flight gear. So starting from the top, uh, let's uh, doff the cap, sir. Yeah, putting all this leather and shilling stuff on, we call sweating to the old east. You know, 
Richard Simmons stole that from us years ago. Okay, so you can see an improvement in the cap, flying the leather uh, aviator's helmet here. So this is known as the Type C, which replaced the Type B. A lot more comfortable fit, better avionics. You can see the smaller receivers. They're still padded inside. Um, same kind of rig from an electronics continuity standpoint. He's got the bell plug. It's replaced by more simple, straightforward. And like the early war one, it is connected both to the earpieces, the earphones in the helmet, and also the microphone, which is in the oxygen mask. So again, this kind of primitive chamois one, that's the D. After the D came what? The E. And after the E came, no, not the F, the E star, the improved E star. So they improved some of the rigging around here, make it more comfortable on the face. Uh, and you can also see the connection coming through here with some internal wiring. Um, just basically upgraded a little more rugged, a little more efficient in the, uh, in the air and in the cockpit, and definitely, definitely improved communications, uh, plane to plane and plane to base. So c continue on down. This pa the uh, uh, 1932 pattern, May West, was replaced by the 41, and it's got pockets. It's got a trigger system. It's, you can also inflate it by the hose, but it's also got a lever with a CO2 cartridge, kind of like the ones they issue on the airliners that they say pull tug down. So you're not huffing and puffing while trying to get all this gear off while you're bobbing around in the Pacific and zeros are flying around trying to strafe you. Uh, so it's just a much more improved. You can see there's, there's pockets. There's a, a lantern to illuminate uh, where you are. If it's gotten dark, you can just pop that out, pop, pull the plug, insert that. The battery goes on. And that'll operate in the water. So if you've gone down at dusk, now you've got something beeping, you know, a light that uh, can show you off there. And there's some other things here that you can't see. There's like a pull tab strap that's on the back to help people get into a boat and stuff like that. That's all tucked behind here. But let's talk about this parachute system. So let's have you do the 180, okay? So what we have here is a parachute and this is not just an over-glorified seat cushion. This is actually a dinghy. And they found out that it was much, much, what were the uh, casualties doing a traditional bailout using the, going, versus going the dinghy route? About 80%. About 80%. So significant reduction in casualties by going uh, with this particular set. So all of this would sit in a metal pan inside the fighter. This would be the parachute. This would be a dinghy inside here that can be inflated. There would also be some supplies and other things like that. Uh, to help him survive a float uh, while bobbing around in the, uh, in the Pacific. And if you turn around to the front again, you can see the cable that runs up through here, through this channel, canvas channel here, and here is the D-ring. They didn't really call it the, the rip cord. It's the D-ring. And that cable goes through this conduit and pulls this open. And these are, these are bungee cords. These are bungee cords that hold these things shut. And turn off, as soon as you pop that in, these pop open, this springs open. This goes past him, gets ripped up like that, and these that are strapped to him rather firmly right now become the risers. Okay. All right. And thank you to Lieutenant, Lieutenant, excuse me, 1945. All right. Do we have time for questions or we do move on? Okay. All right. We've been told we to change our override program. Thank you for being a great attentive audience. If you want to see this stuff up close and personal, come on over to our camp after the show is done. And these guys can tell you way more than I can tell you about it in the 15, 20 minutes that we had. Give yourself a hand for being a great audience and enjoy the week. Take care, everybody. We have Don Chappelle over here. is the owner of the aircraft along with his, his wife. And this is... <laughs> Mr. Vasquez, and he is he is a pilot of this airplane. Danny, he is also qualified in, I guess, all the rest of the war birds in World War II, which is important because we're going to compare later on the flight characteristics of this airplane to the other ones you've flown. The airplane, I'm going to read all these off, and this it's is really kind of unbelievable. He's a, qualified in the Hurricane, the Spitfire, the P-51, P-47, Zero, P-40, Wildcat, Yak, and Bearcat. Is that all of them? Yeah. And a T-6. Probably a T-6 too, right? Yeah, T-6. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
<coughs> well, tell us a little bit about the history. They, they, we had some of the history there on the video, but tell us the history about how this airplane was developed. Well, it was a direct development of, of the war. Uh, the Spitfire had, <coughs> had kind of gone through its whole pace. There wasn't much more they could do to it. They put it just about every engine you could find that was an inline engine they tried to put on it. So they, the RAF basically asked for a better airplane. And so what this is, is it's the pinnacle of propeller-driven airplanes. All of the work done from the Wright brothers to the jet engine are wrapped up in this airplane. So every design characteristic, every improvement aerodynamic-wise that you could muster out of a propeller-driven, piston propeller-driven airplane is in this design. Okay, well, now Bernie, you mentioned in, inside a few minutes ago about the RAF developing the airplane when the war was over, so they didn't they didn't use it anymore. But it was used as a ground aircraft by other countries. Is that correct? Yeah, where this airplane really came alive was the RAF had specced it. They wanted a better airplane to replace the Spitfire and Hurricane because they were aging out of the fleet. They designed this airplane, and it was, you know, flown in 47, and it was getting ready to be produced. But like everything else after the war, there was a surplus of everything. So there was thousands or hundreds or however many Spitfires and Hurricanes laying around that they just didn't see the reason to spend the money. So they basically canceled their order, and the Royal Navy came to him and said, well, can you make it a carrier-based airplane? Because at that point, jet technology wasn't, had, hadn't progressed enough by 1950 to make a jet go off an aircraft carrier in any successful rate. So the Royal Navy went back to Hawker and said, can you design the airplane? And they had already, it had already been in the works. So they put folding wings and tail hook, beefed up the landing gear, and it was very successful for the RAF. Then they actually went out and made a uh, export version of it. That's where the airplane came alive. Most of them were built as Sea Furies, because if you're going to put all that, if you're going to go to the effort to design it that way, the wings were still going to swing. Just right. put the hydraulics in it. So they they did make fur straight Furies that were just attack, ground attack, and fighters. But the Sea Fury ended up being kind of the most produced because it was, if you had a Sea Fury, you could put it on a boat or you could do it on land. So it really, really got an export. It went to Canada, it went to Burma, went to Cuba. It Obviously, most of the stuff it did was during Cuba and, um, right. and Iran. Right. So, so it was actually flown in the, the Cuban invasion? Correct. Against us. <laughs> now, how many of these were still flying with the, with the, uh, on active duty, I suppose you would say, with, with these, these countries? Back into up until when? I think that, don't quote me on this, but I think the last ones were actually retired up into the 70s. Germany had a, had a fleet of a Mark 20 as a two seat version of this. It is, there is no difference in airframe except for it has a slightly larger horizontal. Um, and they used them as target drones up to the 70s. Well, talk to us a little bit about the original engine that was in this, this had terrors. The, Bristol Centaurus, so that, we'll go back to the whole airplane and the design. The Centaurus is a pretty amazing airplane engine. It's a rotary valve sleeved engine. So you have a piston that goes up and down. Then where we have valves, we call them poppet valves, that you have an intake and an exhaust, and those work, and there's a bunch of monkey motion to make them push rods and all that. The Bristol Centaurus had a sleeve in it. So there's a gear that, drove, that did a circle, and then the sleeve went up and down and turned, and it shared it, some exhaust ports with intake ports, so it would take a breath of air in, and then it would close all the ports off, and it would squeeze it and bang it, and then it would turn, and it would exhaust it. So it was like a self-honing piston, because this thing went up and down all the time, and so did the piston. Mm -hmm. So the, the sleeve rotated, the piston went up and down, and the cylinder head has rings in it. So it's super complicated, but they were... They were bulletproof. They had more moving parts in them than this engine, 
but they were all geared together, so there wasn't there wasn't any right. slop. And they really, really did make the Swiss watch of an engine. I well, mean, that, it, well, this one has a thirty three fifty in it, and most of them do. Why why were they converted to thirty three fifties? Because it that was, was like such an efficient engine. It so back in the day when they all got surplused and the and the civilian population started to to fly them, they would basically fly them and didn't really understand the engines. And these were still in service. They were still building 3350s through right. through the 70s. So people, the original engines were getting harder and harder to find parts for. Nobody makes parts for them. So they just, the logical shift was put something in its place that was similar. And this is like 400 horsepower different. So and it's, it it's fit pretty compatible. Abs and it absolutely fits in the same hole. The, there is no modification to the cowling. You have to make a different engine mount. You have to change the exhaust. But there's no modification to the cowling other than a little bit of grinding you have to do, and it fits right in the hole. So that was just kind of the logical. Most of the airplanes were in America. Americans understood American engines, so that's what yeah. they did. Well, how about the specs on the airplane speed and the range for that? Uh, without drop tanks, you get about two hours of gas, and you're going about – you're go you're – Covering the ground, you're going 320 miles an hour, so you can get a thousand nautical out of it. You put drop tanks on it, you can go almost 3,000. But it's really a little short, little on short legs. Typical like British, most, most British. Yeah, it was made to go across the channel, fight, come right back. Okay, what armament did you carry on it? They had four 20 millimeter cannons, How about and then it? they had a numerous array, typical of that time. This was like the the. Uh, Sky Raider of Great Britain. You could put all kinds of stuff on it. They had rockets. They had dumb bombs. They had napalm. They had uh, kind of guided rockets that they would, you know, tethered. Right. So, well, the first real war it was in was in was in Korea, right? Correct. So how was it in Korea? It was a very very good fighter because they were still fighting kind of World War II airplanes. It, it they do have a MIG to their, you know, they were. Right. They shot, and I don't remember what squadron it was, but one guy ended up shooting a MiG down. They really excelled, kind of like an A-10 or a Sky Raider, where that where it was became a pretty good ground attack airplane. Okay. Now you've flown all these different airplanes. Compare this airplane to the other P-51, P-40, and no well, comparison. That's not the P-51. <laughs> yeah. I I mean honestly, it's the pinnacle of propeller driven. Airplanes, nothing. It flies more like a jet than it does like a piston-powered airplane. It maintains its speed and energy. When you come diving in on something and you go back up, you don't have to push power up. You know, I mean, it's just it's a. I what I tell people is it's a fire-breathing dragon. I mean, it just goes. Uh, the only thing the Americans built that it will, and I'm I'm biased because I'm American, I guess. But the only better airplane is a Bearcat. Um, and a Bearcat's the same way. It's a p pinnacle of all of the American propeller-driven airplanes. But right. it, And it's so much lighter. So a Bearcat, you take off and you put the nose up in it. I mean, it was made to go intercept Japanese Zeros. It just climbs and climbs and climbs. And, and it's, they're fast. And it's a you put a Bearcat on and it feels like you're in a sports car because it doesn't weigh anything and it's got a huge horsepower engine. This thing, it's heavy. But it goes, but it's kind of like a steam locomotive. You got to get it going. But it's the hardest accelerating airplane I've ever been in, other than an S two B. Well, it's got a nice wide gear for a tail dragger. It's probably a good good airplane to land, isn't it? Yeah, except for you're landing at, you know, 130 knots. You're coming down final. Yeah. So it's, you, everything that's happens really that, fast. That's pretty fast. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, yeah. It's 130 on short final, and you're touching down about 115 knots. Oh, that so, is, yeah. That's so what you're, most you're, lighter. You're not operating out of any 1,500 airstrips, are you? Negative. <laughs> and you not going to happen. Maybe <laughs> once. <laughs> yeah. You don't get to use a tail. And you don't get to use a tail hook. <laughs> yeah, no, and and they, I can't. I keep asking. You know, some of these Air Force bases have the hook. He doesn't really. He's worried I'm going to break it. <laughs> did they? Did they have to do a lot of modification to make this carrier qualified? As far no. as <clears throat> uh, the original design did not have a folding wing and then as soon as they realized that they could make it work on a carrier they totally redesigned the wing and put the wing fold stuff in there 
So even if Fury has the pit, the bolt that it pivots on on the front and rear spar, that's always in there. The locking mechanism is in every Fury. The only thing they did was they stripped the hydraulics out of it. So when you want to fold a, f a straight Fury wing, you have to do it with like a forklift or a ladder or a crane, and then you literally unzeus the door. There's a manual way to lock and unlock these two. Mm -hmm. it, in the war, they had to go. So if the hydraulic wouldn't, if the, you couldn't get the hydraulic pin in, they would just grab a screwdriver and they'd lock, physically lock it and then lock this door. Oh, so okay. the Fury is the same way. You get unlock it, get a couple guys push the wing up. You have to put a, you have to put a uh, bolt apparatus to keep the wing from folding too far. Mm -hmm. But you just pin that. I mean, like the the I worked for Sanders way back when, and we did quite a few of these things. And we had a couple airplanes that were two three two was an air racer that Hoot flew. Mm -hmm. And uh, we pinned the wing every time we were going to work on it. You know, we had ADI tanks and spray bar tanks and everything in the wings, but we needed room in the shop, so we'd fold those wings and just pin them. Well, did they have to do anything to the spine or anything for these they did a, landings that the Navy makes? They beefed up the landing gear a little bit. The um, A lot of them would have a double oleo, and then they changed the structure back in the tail. But honestly, if you looked at the structure that that tail hook is hooked up to, you would never want to go on a carrier with it because it looks like it's two toothpicks in a Band-Aid. <laughs> but it works. Yeah. How about the quirks for the airplane? You know, versus the other airplane? Um, it's like every carrier-based airplane. It's made to basically crash onto a deck and get pulled straight with a hook. So it's on the ground. It can be... It can be challenging. It's got a nice wide gear, but when the tail comes down, it's the flaps come down to like 85 degrees. So, I mean, it's like a barn door, and they're just drag. They're yeah. not Fowler flaps or anything. They just come straight down. So when the tail is transitioning from a tail high to tail low, you never three-point a Sea Fury. It's all, you'll just have a bunch of parts on the ground. So you come in and wheel land it, and you steer it with the brakes, and then when the tail starts to come down every now and then, about every third landing, it'll go, and you just, you just have to know it's going to happen. Well, you say you steer it with the brakes. Is it a little short on the rudder? No, it's not short on the rudder. It's just got really, really, really good brakes. So the original airplane, being it's British, they would have had a bicycle handle right. and a rudder bar. And it would, you would just have air brakes because you don't need brakes on a carrier. You're right. But on the ground, you do. So... I, I made that statement earlier. I was talking to someone. I'm like, I don't have any idea how they flew them with air brakes. Because I fly a Spitfire and a Hurricane and right. Yaks with air brakes. But I would not want to attempt this one. Now, do you have the air brakes on this one? No, we have. So that's one of the modifications with the engine and prop is uh, the Americans put F-102 wheels and brakes on them. The F-102 brake stack was like six or eight. These are only two. So it's, you're trying to stop. A 12,000-pound airplane with these brakes versus trying to stop a 25 or 40,000-pound airplane. So the brakes are super, super effective. Yeah. Well, how about the history of this particular airplane? I'm going to give that to Don because he knows more about the the all-in-all -all history of the airplane than I do. Well, we uh, this airplane was built in 1951, so it's uh, it's been around a while. Uh, Looks like it uh, first saw service uh, in the Fleet Air Arm in '53. So again, it was a British airplane. Uh, went into service in in '53. Uh, don't know too much about the service history, other than the fact that uh, I think in in uh, in 1990 it it came out of excuse me in 19. Let me go back a little bit here. I think it was in in more like 1960. It came out of. Uh, the uh, Fleet Air Arm Royal Navy service and went into a museum in Britain and it was in a, a couple of different museums and then finally in I think it was about 1990 uh, it was sold uh, to a uh, an individual here in the US that was going to restore it and and fly it uh, I think uh, he he passed away as a state then sold it uh, to uh, Dr. Dave Peeler in, in Memphis Tennessee that ended up completing the restoration and uh, it did a, it did a beautiful job, and then uh, my wife and I were looking for uh, 
uh, for Warbird uh, some five, six years ago, and we were looking at P-51s and Corsairs, and we came across this bird, and, and we were just taken by it. It's hard not to be. And we got connected with Bernie, and, and the rest is history here. Well, how about the significance of this particular paint job on here? Yeah, I think, again, the, the paint job kind of uh, matched up pretty well with uh, what the uh, fleet air arm of the Royal Navy was using back back in the day, back in uh, in the 40s and early 50s. So I think it's really a, kind of a historic paint job for the most part. I think the yellow spinner and and uh, such is a bit different, but I think for the most part it's, it's uh, matching up with a lot of the Royal Navy's uh, paint scheme. Yeah, I think like so many warbirds of, of kind of the 90s, it's in a somewhat of an authentic paint job with right. with Mr. Peeler's twist on it with a yellow spinner, and then he had a big P on the tail. Right. His last right. name was Peeler, so um, it I, it I wouldn't say it has any significance. It doesn't represent an airplane that right. did anything, okay. not oh. like. No or anything. squadron or, no. or individual. Just okay. basically represents a fleet airplane of the time. Okay. Well, let's make a little walk around here, and you don't have to get into a great deal of detail because I've got friends that will do it for an hour. So. <laughs> <laughs> but just tell us a little bit about what, you, what you're looking for when you're coming out here for, for your walk around. Oh, when we're doing a pre-flight? Yeah. Oh, you're just a typical airplane, so we're checking tire pressure. Uh, on this particular airplane, you want to make sure it's a radial, so we're making sure it's not hydraulic locked. These propellers are pretty, they're pretty cool for what they are. All the American propellers, other than a Curtis Electric, they use engine oil right. to change the pitch. Right. This thing has a little hydraulic pack built in on, into it, so you, we put hydraulic oil in it, and then it's got a bar that sticks off the side of the case that holds a, a stator. And then when the propeller's turning, it's its own hydraulic pump and everything. So you don't, as long as the propeller's spinning, you can still control the propeller. Well, there are not many airplanes that use the old products prop, are they? No. Yeah, there's K model Mustangs, uh, H model Mustangs, Sky Raiders. Uh, early Beach 18s had two bladed ones on them. Um, so they, when we're doing a walk around, you're, you're looking for hydraulic fluid. Right. If there's any hydraulic fluid. They have a natural kind of uh, static leak, but if you see a bunch of hydraulic fluid on a blade, you'd have to take the spinner off figure out what was going on. All right. When you're when the wings are down and locked, if you've got a pin or something that you can look at it up on the top? Yeah, of so I don't know if you can see it, you but probably. around the back, when the wings come down, there's a post that's out right there, There's a and it sticks okay. up about an inch. Right. So that indicates that the locking pin hasn't engaged. So they, they kind of slide out, and that lowers. And it, when it's flush, you know the wing's locked. And then well, you double-check the handle. Then they hid the handle behind you. They put it way back here so you didn't accidentally grab it. So, so you've, got a hand, you've got to lock it to put that pin down. No, you just put the wings down. It does it all by itself. It's well, got, why is it sticking up now, though? Because the other wing's not down, and this lock okay. hasn't. It hasn't finished the sequence. Okay. So, but right. the handle is locked, and then you, there's a safety. The gear handle and the, and the wing fold handle are the exact same product. They just turn them around. So you double-check to make sure that it's locked. So, okay. Um, well, another cool feature about a Sea Fury, which a Bearcat is the same, because obviously they were... It was all the same technology, yeah. but this aileron, if you, if you were to get in right now and I held this aileron, you could move the stick full deflection. The aileron will not move. This, you'll see this tab do this. It's tab. It's a spring tab. So when I'm flying, I get in it. When I'm sitting there, the stick force that I have in the cockpit on the ground not running is the exact same stick force I have going 500 knots. Never changes. You never touch the trim. It just... You, what, there's a fixed trim tab that you that you adjust for right. what you're doing going cruising, but this tab flies the aileron. The aileron is not physically attached to the stick in any it. way, shape, or form. Right. How about the tail back here? What are we looking for back here? Uh, the tail, you're making sure the tail struts up, and you're obviously going to check any rivet lines or anything like that. The tail hook is pretty cool. They There's a handle in the cockpit, and the tail hook just falls out. Once you landed, the ground crew had to come back and do the, and lock it in place. 
and like I had it unlocked here. And it actually kind of articulates back and forth so that if, if you kind of got sideways, it would move and basically cushion the, cushion the crash onto the carrier when it caught the cable. Actually, it looks, that doesn't look like it's very big. That's what I was telling you. If you got back there and looked at all that, you would not want to fly that on a carrier. Uh. It's got itty bitty little bolts that hold it all together. <laughs> I was looking at one. They have one of the only Centaurus powered ones. There's two left in the United States, and they both happen to be at Sanders Aircraft right now. I went over there, I think it was two weeks ago, and they were we were doing a photo flight, and they have one of these that's all undone. And I looked in there and I said, are you guys just putting the hook back on for fun or what? What do you mean? That's all the structure in there. I said, I don't ever want to land one of those on a carrier. I mean, it is, it does not look like it should work, but somehow it does. But it does. It does. Or it did. I don't know if it does anymore. Yeah. Another unique thing about um, Hawker, the way they did stuff, you know, in America, everything gets riveted. And they figure out a way to get in there and hard, solid rivet it. They said, we're going to produce airplanes and we're, screwed. We're, we're sick of trying to make all this stuff so you can get your hand in there. This whole side is pop riveted. This whole side is solid rivets. Same with the horizontal, the elevator. They, if they couldn't get to it, they just put a pop rivet in it. Huh. And that was, that's like bad juju in America, but here they just went, whatever. It's a well, special pop rivet, though. Well. Of course, they probably figured it was dispensable, too. Yeah, the life expectancy. <laughs> that, the 109 it cracks me up. They had that Del Mar engine had like a 50-hour service life. Yeah, 50 so hours like during the war got. was probably a lifetime. What's it? ME-262-10? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, they, as the war progressed, they went backwards with, with times. All but right. it was a... It was a military asset. They were just building it to go serve a purpose, and then it was going to get thrown away. Well, like the B-17, is this reversible? Can you turn it over on the other side and make the right one the left one? They did. Yeah. And the horizontals are interchangeable between airplanes. You can, you can yank one horizontal off and put on. Right. You know, okay. it, it had that ability. The British are... I want to talk bad about the British, but they make things very difficult. We would do it with one bolt, one washer, one locking nut. The British would use three bolts, six washers, three nuts, and then when they would tighten them, instead of using a locking nut, they would take a ball-peen hammer and a punch, and they would peen over the threads in three spots. Oh. So every bolt has, every nut and bolt has three indents so that it, they wouldn't back out. That makes life really hard on a mechanic when you've got to replace a part. And you don't use them again either. <laughs> you cannot use them again, no. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, it's a beautiful airplane, and uh, has anybody got any questions out here? We've got a little roving mic here, and they he, he can answer anything. If he doesn't know the answer, he'll make it up. Absolutely. Wait just a minute. Fuel, fuel burn on this particular application is at normal cruises about 90 to 100 gallons an hour. A Bristol Centaurus, that's another cool thing. So let's go back and we'll talk about that engine. In a normal airplane, American engine, you take off and you set a power setting. You have the prop all the way forward and it's turning 3,000 and say 52 inches. And when you want to come back on the power, you m then move the throttle and you set the propeller for whatever you want to right. do, 30, 20 for climb, whatever right, right, right. it is. Centaurus, you take off and you go to full throttle, clunk. You reach down and you flip a lever and then you put the gear handle up and the gear comes up and when the red lights go out, you reach over and you grab the propeller handle and you just go whack. Just put it all the way back and it goes to auto. And it's now you fly the entire flight off of how much fuel you want to burn. So climb is 220, 220 gallons an hour. and It sets power and RPM for whatever you're doing. Is that like the Fuckle 190 also? Isn't that like, kind of like this? I don't know if they did that or not. I think the Fuckle. It, it's, it's, did it have yeah. an auto? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I, I don't know anything about it, but I know this airplane, and you fly the whole thing on fuel flow, and that's what made a sleeved valve, well, a rotary valved engine, sleeved engine versus a poppet valve engine 
they're 20% more efficient because you're not using any fuel to cool the exhaust valve. It's a sleeve. It just moves. Right. Yeah. So it's, it operates at whatever temperature it is where, like, this airplane, you're just throwing gas away because you're trying to cool the charge down right. that's going by that exhaust valve so you don't melt it. Yeah. So when they got into that technology, now a uh, uh, normal Centaurus-powered Sea Fury at cruise, you're like 60 gallons an hour, going 300 miles an hour. I mean, you, that's yeah. why it, they had much better range with a Centaurus than with a 3350 or a 2800 because it had 20% more, 20% less fuel burn. Okay. Anyone else? Hey, question about... Kyle? Question about uh, if wait just a minute, wait just a minute. wait just a minute, so we can hear you. She, she has one though. Yeah, I have one. Go ahead. You go first. Hey, where are you? I'm right here. Do I have the mic? Over here. Oh, I'm you're down there. Okay. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. You're so little. <laughs> <laughs> this airplane was was built in uh, you know a, a later, more toward the jet age. If you were to take this, since you've flown all these airplanes, 109, P51. Uh, Spitfires, if you were to take this airplane and take it back fighting against in the European arena, how would it perform compared to all those other airplanes and your kind of perspective of if you could uh, take it back and, and fly it against those, how would, would it have uh, done? Uh, it would have probably done better than expected because it was faster than everything. So it would have been a really hard thing to fight. If you got in a pure turning war, it probably wouldn't be that great because it takes such a long distance to turn it around. But it would come out of the sky at 400 knots and shoot you and then pass you. And there's not, there was nothing of World War II that could keep up with it. So it was like the 262 where they would just come in and thro they'd come by and strafe you Make and then just throttle out of it. And they wouldn't even throttle up. They'd just go. And then they'd come back around and they'd do that till they took their opponent out. So I think it would, you, the, I think the way they would have fought with the airplane was the exact same way the Germans did with the 262. Did it? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to know how many hours you personally have in this airplane. In this airplane? Yeah. Maybe 150, 100 something. I, probably not even that, honestly. I don't know. I've flown it. I've picked it up in Mississippi or no Memphis. Yeah, uh, but you you have other other time. Yeah, I I fir the first one I flew was one in California with a Centaurus on it, and then uh, really my best friend brother had one in California that we put a lot of time on. It subsequently just went to Germany. And they're flying it there it's, um, pretty successfully. So this particular airplane, I, I honestly, I don't know. But I, I, if I had to guess, I'd say 100 hours over the last five years. Could you tell any difference between this airplane and the Centaurus? Uh, yeah. This one, you have to step on the right rudder. <laughs> yeah, turns yeah, yeah. the other way, you got to step on the other rudder. And it's funny. I don't care how much you tell yourself that. Muscle memory takes over. You start going down the runway, and you start putting it, and you go, oh, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> so, But as far as performance, they were... Compatible, performance-wise, between the Centaurus, the thirty-three fifty, and the twenty-eight hundred. If you put blinders on me and stuck me in one, and it was already flying, and you just let me go, I wouldn't know. Okay. They have a very tight uh, cowling. Do they ever ever have any cooling problems, especially when they put the bigger engines in? It's actually amazing what that spinner combination did. So. Uh, Stock Sea Fury, that spinner would be half that diameter. And they ran, they were all aluminum back then, and they were made for a, a Rotol five bladed propeller. So when they started doing these conversions, Sanders made, the Frank made basically a, another metal spinner that was the same size. Had no problems with cooling. They, they, 3350 ran cool all the time, no cylinder head problems. Then they started air racing, and Nelson Ezel's guys built this oversized spinner, put it on, it runs cooler. It runs 20 degrees colder than the small spinner because it was shoving so much air in there 
that it couldn't get around everything so it would spill back out the front of the cowling. And the cooling drag went down significantly with this. So if you just change the spinner, we learned this at Reno, if you just change the spinner, it went about 15 miles an hour faster at the same power. So, But to answer your question, no, it has absolutely no cooling problems. I would say it has a problem getting to temperature. The cylinder heads, I've never seen this airplane have cylinder heads over 190 degrees centigrade. And that's like normal operating temperature. And that's in a 105 degree day doing an air show in Breckenridge and humid is all get up, never got warm. The oil does. That's one of the problems when you do an engine conversion. <clears throat> the Wright's ideology on it was they have oil spraying all over the place inside the engine. It's spraying on the bottom of the pistons. It's spraying on the sides of the cylinder walls. It's spraying the crank. It's spraying the journals. And that oil is transferring the heat out of the bottom of the cylinder heads and the pistons. Then it goes to an American oil cooler, which is the size of me. And it would get cooled and then go back to the tank and go back to the engine. That's a little small. The British having a Centaurus engine, they didn't have valves. They didn't have hot spots. They didn't have cylinders that ran real hot because that's it, it's a much more efficient, like I said, it burned 20% less fuel. So they had a cooler that was adequate for a Bristol Centaurus. You put the same thing in a hole. We've now changed them, and that's an American aluminum cooler redesigned off of a helicopter. But it's still oil is the only temperature issue you have in this airplane is oil. So you'll see here this bar running across actually has a bunch of little tiny holes in it. And there's a tank up here that we call a spar tank that holds like 25 gallons of water. And when I come in the pattern on a hot, hot day, I'll come in, I'll do the initial. The first thing I do is reach down, turn the boost pump on. Second thing I do is turn the uh, spray bar on. And then I switch the door to open. I do the brake. I put 20 degrees of flaps out. I roll out 185 knots, put the gear out, put the rest of the flaps out, make sure the spray bar is on, look at the oil temp and land. And by the time I land, even with the spray bar, it's coming up almost to red line. And then as you roll out, the temperature starts to come down. Yes, sir. Do you know how many? Do you know how many uh, remaining flying examples of sea furies there are? We kind of started counting today. I think there's about 10, maybe 12 in the world. You know, there's a couple that are flying but haven't flown in four or five years. Uh, but, like, Sanders has three that they own and fly. They have Ellsworth Getchell's uh, airplane in their shop right now. In Auburn, California, there's the old critical mass air racer. That's flying again as a as a straight T20. There's this one. Um, there's two in Europe. One just got sold. There's the one in Germany. So we kind of figure there's 10, 12, uh, high side, maybe 15. How many of them have the original engine in them? Getchell, ha Getchell has the original engine, right? Yeah, Getchell's has it, 924, which is Sanders' airplane. And there's one other airplane in Europe that has one, but I don't think that airplane flies anymore. And you either. mentioned that you thought there was only one person that really knew how to work on the engines. There was only really in in today's time a guy in Australia named Nobby. He's kind of the only one that has done anything. I'm sure there's. And I don't want to upset any, but I'm sure there's somebody else that has built engines. I just don't know them. So if you break down, you're not going to get somebody to come out there that afternoon and fix it? That's why my buddy sold that one and it went to Germany as he's just looking at the pros and cons of it. And, you know, to do an engine, to take that airframe and do an engine transformation and make it American wasn't really going to be cost effective for how much fun he had with it. So it was kind of like, man, I don't want to be the guy that screws up a Bristol. So right. he sold it and moved on. Anyone else? How much oil it holds and the fuel burn and takeoff power. It's an interesting statistic. Yeah, it, it, so, you know, most guys do an oil change and you're like eight quarts of oil, right? In your GA airplane. Holds 28 gallons. So we don't, we don't even, you buy a 55 gallon drum to do an oil change. Mm. 
And then uh, Don was talking, you know, fuel burn in a 3350 at takeoff is like 420 gallons an hour. Like you look down at the fuel flow, if you ever were to look down, and the second you came through about 40 inches, that thing would be saying you had 12 minutes of gas left. So it's, it's honestly, it's a jet. You know, a, a F-16 takes off full of fuel. He puts it in burner to take off. He's got like 11 minutes of gas if he just left it there. Yeah. Obviously, you come back off the power, but this is very similar. When you, when you run the power up, if you left it, if you left it there, you would be out of gas in probably 15 minutes. Well, let me ask you this now. I flew the DC-7 back in, back in the <coughs> old ages, and we pulled 55 inches on takeoff. What, what do you pull on this thing? We're 52 dry. We would be 55 wet. But any more with today's gas and the fact that it's got enough horse. I, I have personally never used more than 45. Mm -hmm. I just I don't see a reason to. Well, there's no point in punishing the engine either. And that's why it's gone so long. I yeah. mean, if you, a Mustang, they, 61 inches was takeoff power. In the airplanes that we fly today that are, they're 2,000 pounds lighter than they were. I have had the opportunity to fly Lopes Hope, and it was, it's at weight. It's the way it would have went to war. I ran the power up on that airplane, and I, I, I went to like 52 inches the first time I took off, and it kept going and kept going and kept going and kept going, and the tail never came up, and I went ooh, up to about 55. Then it accelerated, and it went. So there's no reason for us to run those powers. After right. that day, I went, man, they've had 61 inches, not because they wanted to or it was a cool number. It, was, it needed that to get off the yeah. ground. These airplanes don't. They're so much lighter than, than they fought. Yeah. So we just don't. And we don't have piles of engines laying at a depot that we can call up and go, hey, send me another 3350. All right. Okay. Well, Bernie, thank you very much. Thank you. Don, appreciate you bringing the airplane here. How many veterans we have in the audience here? Please stand up. Let's appreciate the veterans. Yeah, thank you for your service. Thank you, folks, for coming. We appreciate you being so patient for us. And uh, please come back tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Uh, we're going to have a, another, another, we have one at 10 o'clock and 1 o'clock for the rest of this week. And at 1 o'clock, please try to be here. Bud Anderson's going to be here, our really true hero. So uh, try to be, be there at 1 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernie. Appreciate Thank it. You. you always do great.